practice. So this is the typical uh, sample from a patient who has um, had a rheumatoid arthritis for several years, as you can clearly see swelling here and really massive swelling here, which comes from the joint and also from the tendons. We'll come to that later on. So by definition, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disease and it is characterized by symmetrical deforming and peripheral polyarthritis. There is also, as we've seen in this picture before, tendovaginitis and also bursitis. Um, the disease is systemic, so it can also have extra articular manifestations, for example, cardiovascular or lung disease. So the prevalence is about 1%. Um, more uh, ladies than men, so it's not rare, and you will definitely see patients who suffer from this condition. The peak onset is age 50 to 70, but uh, it may, all, may also be present in younger or older patients. There's a juvenile, juvenile arthritis, um, which can start from kids as young as one or two, and there's a late onset form, which is called LORA, um, late onset rheumatoid arthritis. So risk factors are smoking and obesity, but they are not like the, the uh, only culprits. Um, by pathology, it is an autoimmune disease. There's autoantibody formation against citrullinated peptides, which are called abbreviated ACPA, and the FC part of the IgG molecule. Um, which is also called rheumatoid factors. And they, those antibodies are found in approximately 50 to 80% of patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. So um, not all the patients do have those auto antibodies, although they are clear, clearly suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. You need to bear that in mind when doing diagnostics. Um, there is a genetic pre predisposition. So if your parents suffer from this, um, you might as well uh, suffer from it, but it's not a 100% sure. Um, plus, it needs a trigger, and viral infections are discussed for that, but there's no definite proof which virus can cause that. So, um, if you will see inflammatory infiltration of the synovia with autoreactive T cells, um, which will lead to a synovitis and um, which can be seen by a joint effusion. I will show you more pictures about that later on. And there's also a tenosynovitis, which leads to the destruction of cartilage joints and tendon, which in case, uh, also leads to tendon ruptures, so can lead to. Um, the swollen joints lead to instability, and the instability of the joint will lead to deformity, which uh, usually has a typical... Um, a uh, typical picture, which I will show you later on. Um, and there is also the production of systemic pro-inflammatory cytokines. So um, you will see um, uh, high, raised levels of those cytokines, for example, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, or TNF-alpha, which is um, important because there you can start the treatment. If you block those uh, cytokines, patients will improve. I will tell you more about that later. So this is a picture um, of the joint effusion of the pathology. So this is just one um, bone, the other bone, this is the cartilage. No? And here you have the effusion in the joint. This is the synovia, synovial membrane, which is um, inflamed and produces a lot of fluid, which leads to the distension of the joint capsule and the capsular edema. And also, uh, the inflammatory tissue is undermining the joint here, which is called panus. So that leads to little holes here and destruction of the bone. Um, this is a picture from Netter Atlas. Uh, early stage here, inflammation on the sides with joint capsule, more inflammation, panus, uh, and in some cases, it can lead to ankylosis of the joint. Now, the patient here is in considerable pain. Here, he's in no pain at all because there's no more inflammation, which is also used for a therapeutic uh, procedures. Um, this is actually the same slide as you've seen before. 
And this is a knee joint opened. And here you can see uh, this is what it looks like from the inside. All the red inflamed tissue, which you can see. And this is, um, this is also like more of the same. So which joints are affected? Huh? This is important because you will need it for diagnostics. It will usually go first. Either it can be the wrist joint, but most likely it's the metacarpophalangeal joints and the PIP joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints of hand and feet. In late arthritis, even other joints may be affected. But this is the typical distribution It at the beginning. If you see a patient who has symmetrical swelling of MCP joints in both hands, you need to have a high index of suspicion. So the presenting complaint, patient will come and complain about symmetrical, swollen, painful, and stiff small joints of hand and feet, mostly in the morning, and the morning stiffness will last more than one hour. If the patient just says, yeah, 10 minutes, that's not enough. You need to ask, well, how long are you stiff in the morning? So if the patient presents with this, it's very easy to diagnose, but unfortunately, um, uncommon presentations are quite common. It can begin with asymmetrical swelling. It may be just one joint. Um, a friend of mine um, came to me. She had just one of her foot joints of the little toe, small toe at the side was inflamed. So it took me a while to sort it out. There might be a polymyalgic onset. Patient com uh, complain about pain everywhere. All the muscles are sore. It might begin as a systemic illness with fever, weight loss, and fatigue. And there are many more presentations. So it's not always easy to diagnose. I've seen one lady who presented to the most famous rheumatologist in our city. And he said, no, no, this is not rheumatoid arthritis. A year later, he had to reconsider his decision. That's not because he was too stupid. It's because the disease is difficult, sometimes very difficult to diagnose. So this is a very famous picture, which you all know. Um, if you have a look at her hands, huh, they don't really look like normal hands. You see the swelling here and the swelling here. So if you have a closer look, this might actually be, we couldn't, of course we cannot ask him. This might be a patient presenting with uh, early rheumatoid arthritis. So how do you um, examine a patient like that? Early signs are those swollen joints here with synovitis. There is fluid inside. It's not a hard swelling, it's a soft swelling. And you can find it out by the, you, you will have a positive squeeze test. You take the hand of, sorry, the question? Sorry. Um, so you take the hand of the patient in your own hand have both your thumbs on here, and with the index, you raise uh, the bone up here. So you can feel the swelling here, which is kind of softly. Once you felt it once or twice, you will always recognize it anyway. Um, the alternative is you take an ultrasound and you will see there's fluid in the joint as well, but you actually don't need it. Once you've practiced that technique, you will, it's very easy to find out. Later signs in the patient are the typical deformities. Um, this is the vocabulary you really should know in connection with rheumatoid arthritis. It's the ulnar deviation of the hand in connection to the radius. There's the subluxation of the wrist and fingers. This is kind of dropping down here from the, from the radius here. Uh, you will have boutonniere deformity. You will have swan neck deformity and the Z-shaped thumb, which is also called sometimes 90-90 deformity. You have 90 degrees here and you have 90 degrees angle here. Um, at the beginning, those deformities are still flexible and you can cor correct them if you bend it over. But at the, at the end, um, it will not be, uh, you will not be able to correct it. You will also have ulnar deviation of those fingers in this direction. Now they will kind of bend over. And you will have the rupture of extender tendons, as you can see here. The swelling here uh, infiltrates the tendon and kind of nibbles away at the tendon, and you, it will rupture at the end. So there are now a few um, 
paintings of the uh, of the hand with the swelling here you can see it's more like diffuse diffuse swelling here you have a patient who already had rupture of the extensor tendon if you ask him to straighten his fingers up he's unable to do it huh? he won't be able to do that here is the the reason for that um the tendovaginitis as you saw on the first slide I showed you it's a big massive lump and it infiltrates the tendon it kind of nibbles away on it here the swelling of the joints and this is a very very late case where all the extensor tendons are uh, ruptured and uh, there's a subluxation of the wrist in palmar direction and those patients are seriously handicapped um, and they really have problems coping in their um, uh, daily activities. Here you can see the ulnar deviation, boutonniere deformity, and all those kinds of things. Nowadays, there's good treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, so hopefully you're not seeing too many of those. But about 25 years ago, um, they were pretty common sites. So, late signs on the feet. The patient will suffer from pace plantar valgus and abductus. If you have a look here, whoops, there is certainly a deformity here. Um, and you have the too many toes sign from behind. You see all those toes here, which you shouldn't actually see from behind. Huh? Here, there's bursitis under the heads of the metatarsals. Large joints might be affected later. And also, um, you should consider cervical spine instability. There's a ligament behind the, the dense axis and that might, um, might rupture, leading to a atlantoaxial joint subluxation. Needs to be considered before you're doing surgery on any patient who has um, rheumatoid arthritis. Some more pictures, um, what the patients might present with, bunions, hammer toes, um, nodules and all that kind of uh, flat feet here you see um, all typical presentations in late stage here we already had a picture of that there are also extra articular manifestations about 40 percent of all patients with rheumatoid arthritis do suffer from them those can be just simple things like nodules especially if the patient is treated with methotrexate um, there might be um, fibrosis of the lungs or pleural disease. A lot of patients do suffer from ischemic heart disease also and might present with a pericardial effusion. There may be peripheral neuropathy and really to consider is osteoporosis. Chronic inflammation, systemic inflammation makes osteoporosis. There's also... Um, osteoporosis at the affected joints, but also systemic osteoporosis. And of course, you need to consider the side effects of medication. A lot of patients are treated with the oral corticosteroids, and they, of course, lead to osteoporosis, to diabetes. So investigations, what do you do if you suspect the patient has rheumatoid arthritis? You should do full blood count, ESR, CRP, rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP, anti, um, the, the, those antibodies which I described to you before. Um, you will usually see signs of chronic infection that will be elevated ESR and CRP and platelets, and there will be anemia of chronic infection, inflammation. Sorry, it shouldn't be infection. Inflammation is the right word here. Sorry for that. The uh, rheumatoid factor is positive in about 70% of patients. So consider if the patient has typical symptoms but is negative, huh, then it's called a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. But also the, the uh, opposite may be true. The rheumatoid factor is positive in about 5% of the population. So it's not specific for the disease. It is positive, for example, in a high amount of pregnant women and in the elderly. So just uh, having a positive rheumatoid factor doesn't make you have rheumatoid arthritis. Anti-CCP antibodies, on the contrary, they are highly specific and reasonably sensitive. 
So if those are positive, you can say, yeah, I'm pretty sure the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I also recommend doing liver and kidney functions tests to help in the decision which medication to take. So what you also should do, uh, you should do x-rays, both hand, hands and feet AP. This is the only case where you don't need x-rays in two planes. Here, exceptionally, one plane will be enough. Um, just to give you um, um, an idea what the joints look like, I will show you some uh, examples. Um, the x-rays may be negative in very early stages. Um, you might see soft tissue swelling, swelling around it. You will see extraarticular osteopenia and a reduced joint space. In the late stages, you will see bony erosions from the pannus, which I showed you earlier on, which makes those little holes near the bone. You will see subluxation and articular destruction. You might also see ankylosis. Ultrasound is useful to help and helps you to detect intraarticular fluid and tendovaginitis. Um, MRI is helpful um, if you want to detect synovitis early. And um, you can see bone marrow edema, which is sometimes helpful to detect very early cases. And it's especially helpful in ambiguous cases where you're not really sure if this, if, is this a rheumatoid arthritis or something else, um, then an MRI scan will, will certainly help you on. It's not needed for the typical presentation. Here are some x-rays. This is an early stage. Here you see the osteoporosis, extra articular osteoporosis. Sometimes if you look exactly at the picture, you don't see it. Hold the film a little bit further away from you from the distance, you can easily see here osteoporosis near the joints, normal bone here, here osteoporosis again um, near the joints. Here you can see those little erosions where the arrows are. Yeah? Here, this is very clearly uh, not normal. Here, little nibbles, nibbles away. Uh, here as well. This is more late stage. You can also, here you see big erosions. This doesn't really look like a normal joint at all. This might be considered a no, nearly normal joint. This certainly isn't. The big destruction here, this starts with ulnar deviation already. And this wrist joint is um, so deformed, you can't even see, delineate this, the, the borders between the bones. Huh? It's like a big single bone in here. Huh? Here is a hole. This is very typically, it's called Mannerfeld crypt, typical thing here. And where you, if you're not sure, start looking at the styloid process. Um, here it really makes, a, it starts, you can see little holes nibbling away here. So there are some more pictures, normal joint, rheumatoid arthritis joint, very typical changes here. Uh, here you can see those. Um, it usually makes symmetric um, thinning of the cartilage. Here, this is a knee joint. Uh, in degenerative disease, you usually have asymmetrical thinning of the cartilage. Here, same patient four years later, you can see there's nearly no more cartilage. Huh? This patient will be in severe pain. Here, typical late stage changes. Here, cyst in the bone, no cartilage anymore. Symmetrical loss of the cartilage, not asymmetrical. And here, this big cyst. Here, hip joint, no uh, cartilage anymore, no joint space. Here are some samples of MRI pictures. Um, here you can see the crypt, the manifold crypt that I described before. Inflammation everywhere. Here, big effusion in the distal radial ulnar joint here. Uh, effusion. Um, you needn't really be able to um, diagnose that yourself. You usually have your radiologist who will tell you this is typical for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. There are um, a lot of tutorial videos on x-ray assessment on YouTube, for example, from a guy called Chris Beaulieu. He makes uh, really no lovely videos on how to assess um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis on uh, the videos. Oops, what's that? Yeah, here are some foot 
x-rays here you can see the uh, subluxation this toe is completely gone down uh for out of the joint um here you can't really see where's the border between one bone and the other because they are so soft and this tissue here is actually so soft you can take a needle and sew through it you can really perforate this bone with a just a stable needle late stages this is really dramatic huh? this uh bone is supposed to be up here you can't really see anything here except it's a big mess yeah. so if you have unclear cases where you're not sure you can do joint aspiration under sterile conditions and you will send in the, uh, the uh, fluid you, you send you usually check it for color it's usually a, a yellowish white yellowish color the number of cells you send it to the lab ask for a number of cells ask for crystals might be gout you ask for bacteria might be septic arthritis if you're not sure yeah you should ask your local lab what test tubes should be filled usually it's for it's the one which you use for a full blood count for uh, the number of cells and uh, serum for a tube for the other things but ask your local lab some labs want to different so um and if you really, really, you think it's rheumatoid arthritis, but all the tests are negative or you can't, you have no access to any test. You can just start prednisolone, 15 milligrams, once daily in the morning. If you are quite sure that the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, but you can't prove it, yeah? <clears throat> then the patient should be getting significantly better after about one to two weeks. You give him the steroids and tell him, come back to me after one to two weeks, and if he says, wow, that's it, I'm much better, that's kind of proves that he is, at least he has some systemic inflammatory disease. If he's not getting better, stop it immediately. Um, because if he has degenerative disease, it's not improved by the steroids. So uh, this is for really, really unclear cases. I've done that once or twice. Usually you will get the diagnosis by other means. Huh? And sometimes diagnosis is only made by histology of synovia samples so you do an arthroscopy of the patient for knee problems you take a sample of synovia send it to the lab and the lab will come back wow the patient has rheumatoid arthritis you say wow i didn't expect that so what else can can it be huh? the patient might suffer from psoriatic arthritis um usually affects different joints but in different uh, sometimes you really have to consider it Psoriatic arthritis may appear even before the patient has psoriasis. So you need really to check the family history. If somebody in the family has a unexplained skin disease and the patient presents with joints, he might, a joint problems, he might have psoriatic arthritis. It might be gout. It might be a systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, he might suffer from osteoarthritis, which sometimes can get inflamed as well. But usually, this will be more a hard swelling and not the soft swelling. The patient might, might suffer from chondrocalcinosis. This is usually the elderly patient who has calcium deposits in the joints. That's most commonly in the knee joint and very rarely in the small joints. And there are many other more rare diseases, but those are the most common uh, differential diagnosis you need to consider. Um, in the early stages, huh, there is no definite proof for rheumatoid arthritis. As I told you, the x-rays may be negative and the rheumatoid factor might, may be negative huh, and also be positive in patients with no RA. So the diagnosis must be made using a combination of several symptoms as defined by the American College of Rheumatologists or the European league of uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis so those criteria criteria can also look them up in the internet um, you need to check you use this in patients who have at least one swollen joint and no other explanation for it yeah? if the patient had a fall recently okay you can't use it yeah? but no trauma no nothing presents with at least one swollen point then you check and you give points yeah? for uh, what you have, what you're seeing in the patients. 
Um, for example, low positive rheumatoid factor gives two points, negative zero points. You can use that or there is a, this tool is available on the internet. You just click on here, 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 and it gives you a score at the end. Acute phase reactants, normal, abnormal, click here. Duration of symptoms, more, less than six weeks, more than six weeks. And, oops, and that will give you a score where you can say, okay, this is pretty um, reasonably that the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, as the point is hit hard and early, the earlier the patient is treated, the better the results are. So you can sh should really re um, try to get the patient referred to a rheumatologist if this is possible. Now for a other lady from Afghanistan, I researched how many rheumatologists are there, there are in Pakistan. In all of Pakistan, there's only 26. So it would be hard to get an appointment there. So this is if possible. If it's not possible, do it yourself. Disease activity is monitored by a desk by a score where you can see how bad is it. See next slide also. And treatment should be escalated until you have satisfactory control over the disease, which is called treat to target. You want the patient to be in complete remission. You're not happy if the patient says, yeah, I feel a little bit better. No, you want him to be completely fine. Because you don't want the patient to end up with those really, really bad results, which I showed you earlier on. And if you treat him hard and early, you can really, it's possible to reach a complete remission patient is really healthy. So the early use of the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which are called DMARDs, and biological agents greatly improves long-term outcome. So you should start within three months of persisting symptoms. Huh? Don't, don't tell the patient, yeah, come back in half a year, I'll give you some steroids and come back in half a year. No, this is not the, um, the, the, the way to, to do it if you have another choice. If you don't have a choice, okay, do it, do what you can. So this is how you monitor the disease. This is the DAS score, which is also available on the internet. This is the, uh, where, where, how to, to get there. You can also click here which joints are affected and you add ESR and which gives you kind of a grade how bad the patient is feeling. How many tender joints, how many swollen joints. You enter that and click enter, calculate and you'll get a result. So high disease activity is defined as more than 5.1, the score result of the DAS28 score moderate disease activity. Yeah? And the aim of treatment, as I said before, is complete remission, or if this is not possible, a disease activity that is as low as possible. Try to get the patient back into his normal life, normal activity. Um, there are new, new definition, you don't really have to know that all by heart. Um, what you really should know, hit hard and early and try to get the patient um, to get him reduce his, his death score. Um, it should be measured all the time you see the patient, you see him first, measure the death score, do a treatment and see will you get him lower or does he come back and say, sorry, didn't help at all. So management, what kind of medication we have? You can give oral steroids, as I said before. They quickly help to reduce symptoms and the inflammation, but unfortunately they don't stop the disease progression. So the patient will feel better, will be happy, but will have significant side effects and it will not stop the progression of the, the disease. So the x-ray will look worse every year if you have a look. And as everybody knows, oral steroids have significant and also life-shortening side effects um, like diabetes, osteoporosis, and many other more if you take them long term. They are very useful in the beginning of treatment, huh? as the other drugs take several weeks for the patient to feel the benefit. So what I usually do, I start with an oral prednisolone, 10 to 15 milligrams in the morning, and I start another disease-modifying agent. I'll come to those later on simultaneously. And as soon as this kicks in and starts to have an effect, I reduce the steroid dose as quickly as possible. I don't stop them immediately, 
but I uh, try to get down. If I started with 15, I go down to 10, then I go down to 7.5 and go down slower. And the aim should be to use steroids just for acute exacerbation if needed and not for the long-term treatment. Unfortunately, this is not always possible. Many patients still need um, maybe 2.5, 5 milligrams uh, prednisolone on the long run. So here's about, um, yeah, more about steroids. If you give them, think about osteoporosis. Huh? Um, if the patient already has osteoporosis that you knew, um, reconsider depending on the severity. Think really, do I really have to give him oral steroids? If not, do a DEXA scan, uh, try to measure how bad is the osteoporosis if you can do that and start vitamin D and calcium per day. Yeah? If the patient already has severe osteoporosis and you must give steroids, you need to treat osteoporosis aggressively. Um, in patients with a history of peptic ulcer, consider giving pantoprazole together with the steroids. Huh? And have a high index of suspicion for opportunistic or septic infections in patients which, which do have um, oral steroid medication. So the patient comes back after three, four, five, six weeks and suffers um, complaints about severe uh, pain in one joint, consider septic in, um, infection. You need to monitor blood glucose, especially in diabetics. Reduce steroid dose as soon as possible, as you, I mean, as soon as possible. If the patient's still considerable pain, it's not possible, huh? but every milligram counts. Huh? Try to get down from five milligrams. Tell the patient, try four, huh? maybe try three. Try to get them down to as low as you can. Huh? Some patients do require long-term steroid medication and try really try to keep it as low as possible. So now the disease um, um, moderating drugs, um, immune Antagonist, it's usually well tolerated and effective. Um, the patient needs usually 7 to 5 to 25 milligrams once per week. This is very important. Um, don't give it daily, this is uh, highly toxic. Once per week, orally, better to take it subcutaneously by injection, it's more effective. Huh? And folate should be given the following day. Side effects are gastrointestinal. Patients will need from nausea and a little bit of vomiting, but this will usually improve the longer the patient use the medication. And it has the side effect of liver toxicity. It might harm the liver. Patients already have been suffering from liver disease. Um, you really need to monitor the liver. If it's kind of compensated, you can still give it. Um, tolerable is a elevation of the liver liver function tests to about three times the normal value. That's still acceptable. Women in childbearing age cannot have it except if they use contraceptives because a metotrexate will harm the unborn baby. Regularly moni regular monitoring of full blood count, liver and kidney function tests is necessary. If the kidney function tests are getting worse, you need to reduce the dose huh? so you don't have a higher dose in the body. Another um, medication for that would be leflunomid. It's a second choice. Also not for women in childbearing age. It has to be washed out before surgery. You know? All those medications um, should usually be used by patients, by doctors who know about the side effects and know how to deal with them. In mild cases, you might consider sulfasalazine and hydrochloroquine. They are not that highly affected, but if you can't give the other stuff due to side effects or to other disease, you can consider uh, trying those. So and there are also kind of new medications which are called biologicals. And here comes in what I said earlier on, um, anti-TNF-alpha. Uh, TNF-alpha is raised because it's a, sim uh, a, a, a systemic um, inflammation. So um, you can use, uh, block those with specific antibodies. This is usually used if two different DMARDs don't work 
and should definitely be initiated by a specialist. Um, there are many new uh, of those specific antibodies in the pipeline. They are highly, highly effective, um, but uh, might have some side effects, possible reactivation of tuberculosis. Um, they might have severe infection with, norm, with normal CRP because here we are blocking the immune system. Huh? So the patient might have a severe infection, you take a CRP and it's normal, so you, you don't really realize what's going on here. So they are really very, very, very efficient, do their job, but to be treated with caution. Um, what patients do really love is non-steroidals, non-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory drugs, for example, diclofenac or ibuprofen. And they're very good for symptom relief, but they have no effect whatsoever on, this, on disease progression. Um, so, sorry, is that a message from, from the team? No. Um, they're good for symptom relief, but they have no effect. Paracetamol and weak opiates are rarely effective, so tramadol is not working. And of course, as hopefully everybody knows, non-steroidals have a high risk of adverse side effects. So you need to monitor kidney and liver function if the patient uses non-steroidals regularly. And consider giving omeprazole once per day if non-steroidals are taken regularly huh, to prevent gastric bleeding. The patient should know what he is taking there. So um, another thing to be done is physiotherapy. Um, the patient should have regular physiotherapy to prevent joint contractures and muscular atrophy. So all the joints should be moved at least once per day. Um, also helpful usually can be assistive splints and assistive devices just like this one uh, to help the patients manage their daily activities. What also, also could be done, intraarticular steroid injections. This is especially helpful if the patient has good general improvement. So the DAS28 is getting down and he says, yeah, I'm feeling fine, but I just have this one joint, which is always irritating me. One or two joints, it's called the rebellious joint. Yeah? One or two joints is just resisting treatment. Yeah? And of course you could um, increase the dose of the medication, but why should you do it if it's generally working fine? So you leave the dosage of the patient as it is, of the, for example, methotrexate, and just treat those two joints and do um, intraarticular steroid injections. It, it should be done, must be done under sterile conditions, and each joint should not be injected more than three times per year because the problem might be joint infection. Uh, if you use it without sterile uh, not under not under sterile conditions, and bacteria manage to get into the joint. And a joint infection usually needs surgical treatment. Another method which can be used in rebellion rebelling joints is radiosynoviortesis, uh, just the RSO. More about that on this um, internet page. And this is the injection of a radioactive substance with a short range of influence. And this destroys the inflamed synovia. This can be done by radiologists under um, X-ray control. Um, you, first, you inject contrast fluid to make sure that you're intraarticular, and then you inject the radioactive substance. So, um, if the patient ha is in more progressed state of the disease, um, he might need a surgical treatment with the aims to relieve pain improve function, and prevent or correct the deformity. The methods are, um, there are several uh, orthopedic methods which you can use. One is synovectomy, surgical synovectomy, uh, um, the, to prevent further destruction of the joint. For example, shoulder. Shoulder is a very good joint to do an early synovectomy. Sometimes what you do, first you do synovectomy, and six weeks later you do radio synoviortesis to just kill the rest of synovia, which is still there. This is uh, pretty helpful and helps some patients for like to, to have several symptom-free years. Uh, so it's really very helpful um, 
to do that early on. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, persuade the patient to have it done. Um, patients with rheumatoid arthritis are usually well tolerated to pain. And uh, they say, ah, if it's not really necessary, I probably don't want to have it. But this is really very helpful. And then uh, you might need stabilizations. Uh, for example, on the thumb, if you have this 90-90 deformity, which I told you, um, the patient doesn't really have a good grip strength. He can't really hold something. And here, the arthrodesis of the MTP1 joint greatly improves grip strength. Um, then you might want to do deformity to corrections. For example, if the patient suffers from a severe hallux valgus, which prevents him from wearing shoes. If he says, I can't wear any shoes because it's so hard, it's so sore, it hurts so much, um, then you might have to correct that. Um, in completely destructed joints, um, you, a patient might need endoprosthesis like knee or hip joint replacements. All those operations are preferably to be done by specialists for rheumatoid surgery. It's a little bit different than the like normal patients um, because as I said earlier on, the bone is very soft. You need to reconsider some things and really should know what you're dealing here. Um, there are some examples for surgical management. For example, here, this patient has Swanson implants um, on his MCP joints here. They are made of silicone, silicone implants um, for those joints, which doesn't give him full range of movement, but it helps much, uh, it, it greatly improves the function of the hand. Um, Problems of surgery are a patient um, often suffer from osteoporosis. It's often present. And the patients are usually immunosuppressed. So they have a higher risk of infection than a non-rheumatoid arthritis patient. They often have impaired wound healing. Huh? This really needs to be considered. And due to affected upper extremities, maybe the patient can't walk with crutches. So he has a foot problem. You want to do surgery on the foot, but the patient tells you, really, how am I supposed to walk afterwards? You can't really walk with crutches. So um, sometimes you really need to make a management plan what to do first. First, you might have to stabilize his wrist so he can walk with crutches, and then you can do surgery on his foot. In long-term patients, you really should consider C-spine, the unstable instability of the cervical spine, um, then he can't get intubation. So uh, flexion, extension, x-rays of the cervical spine should be done before surgery in patients who are long-term sufferers of uh, suffer, um, rheumatoid arthritis. So careful planning is needed, but surgery is often very helpful for the patient. Um, also, uh, you need to manage associated disease. Huh? Cardiovascular risk factors should be monitored. Assess and treat osteoporosis. Huh? Patients should stop smoking. This has been shown to uh, lead to slower progression. And really suspect infection early under immunosuppressive therapy. Huh? Um, always have a high index of suspicion. So the prognosis. Without treatment, um, it has a very variable prognosis. It might be stable and mild in about 10% to 30% of patients. There may be periods of remission in which the symptoms disappear, alternating with periods of flare-ups, or may have a very rapid and aggressive progression with joint destruction within one year. I had one patient who really had a complete wrist joint destroyed within one year because she didn't uh, want to go to normal doctors. She went to alternative medicine, of course, didn't heal it, didn't help a bit. 70% of patients have progressive disease with debilitating consequences. Huh? After about 10 years, 50% of the patients are unable to work. It has an elevated mortality, mostly due to myocardial infarction or to stroke. And the average life expectancy is reduced by 3 to 13 years. So, and the patient have a greatly reduced quality of life. So, really, if you, have, if you think the patient suffers from rheumatoid arthritis, treat early and aggressively. So, the take-home messages are, this is a really nasty disease. You don't want it to, to, to have it. 
have a high index of suspicion. Reassess often if you suspect it and can't prove it. Tell the patient, okay, come back in two weeks, come back in four weeks. Have a look at the patient again. If you think it might be and you can't prove it, um, do it, uh, uh, treat them probatorily with uh, uh, steroids if you suspect it. And remember, the patients can have more than one disease. Huh? He can have rheumatoid arthritis plus osteoarthritis. Huh? I've had patients who were suffering from osteoarthritis and were often always sent away, yeah, this is osteoarthritis, nothing to worry about. But she had additional late onset rheumatoid arthritis. So remember, I mean, it can have more than one disease. Hit hard and early, treat to target, target if possible. Huh? And take home, patients are really used to pain. So if one patient complains of bad pain, really take them serious, investigate them. I've had one lady, she had a uh, ankle joint replacement. She rang the office, said, I need an appointment like today. And she had a dislocated inlay that was dislocated posteriorly on pressing on her ac tendo Achilles. So this lady, when she said, I need a doctor today, there was always something serious. There, were never, there was never something really easy, no problem. So if they really say, I have a problem, they do have a problem. And you really should need to, to realize that. So this is some, these, those are the sources which I use for this presentation. And there are some um, uh, really nice videos and some links to uh, further um, sources which you might want to have a look. So that's been it. I hope, uh, I hope um, 